you actually get a chance to step back and have a look and see how things are going and how things have gone and what you can change. My guest in this episode was raised as one of three in North London to a single parent. Excelling in art and needlework at school, she always wanted to be an artist. Even as a young child, she would make clothes for her sister and would ask the dressmaker down the road for her offcuts. However, very little money denied her the possibility of going to art college. She married at just 17 and went on to have five children. In 1998, she won a national award of £10,000 for producing the most unusual room in Great Britain. Now she spends her time painting, designing her own clothes, visiting family and friends, and very much misses having a garden. She also used to babysit me and take care of me as a child. Debbie Ridsdale, welcome to Unlived Lives. Thank you. So wonderful to have you. Thank Amazing you. to have you here. Tell me about your most unusual room. Well, I was always painting the walls because I didn't have canvases. And I spent a lot of time at Great Ormond Street Hospital and I felt really bad because I knew they'd spent an enormous amount of money moving the church, the chapel. And I was thinking the money could have been spent better elsewhere. But when you think that your child is going to die, going to church in that chapel helped me. I felt I felt comfort. And I looked at the dome ceiling in this chapel and I thought, hmm, I think I could have a go at doing this at home. Because <laughs> it was so beautiful. Sure. Which is what I did. Wow. And um, I'd already won a competition for the kitchen, and they had when they came out, they had a look and they they had a look at the room, and they said, "Oh, will you let us know when you finish it?" I thought they were joking. Anyway, a year later, they actually contacted me and said, "Did you finish your dome room?" I said, "Yes." Can we come and have a look? I said, "Yes." I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it when they phoned me and they said, you've won the first prize of £10,000. Amazing. And it was beautiful. And my whole house was painted. Incredible. I just used to paint all the time. Mm. I even painted the dishwasher because it didn't (laughs) quite fit in with all the Egyptian murals on the walls. (laughs) (laughs) And the fridge freezer. I painted Egyptian food. That must have been quite difficult to paint on as a surface. No, 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 I never found any surface difficult to paint on. No, you you just get an undercoat. And it was all done with emulsion. And and, And it lasted for years and years. So, yes. And so what what does painting represent for you then? Beauty. Expression. I love colour and richness. And, and I read once that beauty was to, to not leave the eye wanting. And mm. I think that's a really good expression because it's true when you want, you want more and more. So, yes, that's what I did. Painted everything. I was on television. Um, I was on the news. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I know. I was watching the news. 
And I'll tell you another fun story. Um, and there I was. It was uh, the same time that they built the dome. Mm. They said, and, and Debbie Ridsdale, Debbie Ridsdale has built, built a dome in her, in her house and they showed it all on the news. Wow. I couldn't believe it. That must have been amazing. It was. And also yeah. once I was in hospital and I was on the, on the television program called Our House. Right. And there was this guy... I'd made friends with this family. I make friends with everybody in hospital. I'm <laughs> looking after them all. And he came in and he said, I'm watching you. You're on the television. I was no in way. hospital. I said, yes, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, I was on television. Surreal. It was. Yeah. Little on me. But most of my family didn't get it. They, mm. But they, let, they just let me carry on. But they didn't embrace it. I think they thought, oh, God, what on earth is she going to paint next? You know. <laughs> is this your, My your family, family, your kids? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like, you know, we bring somebody home because it was just so outrageous. It was like, Mum, nobody else's house is like this, uh, especially Elliot, the youngest. And he, he, I think, obviously, as a child, he didn't understand. And he was like, oh, my God, Mum, what are they going to think mm. when they come here? Mm. But, selfishly i didn't think of that i just it was a way of helping when you've got somebody sick in the family it was a way of helping me not to take my mind off of it but it sort of gave me the strength if you like it gave me such strength because i was so happy and it was such an achievement to be able to cope with with the sad things and the bad things mm. so a form of therapy yeah yeah it was Amazing. And so it was that 88? Yes, I think it was 88. I think I won the money in 88 or 89. And the first thing I did, we had five cats, but they weren't allowed upstairs. And we had a large conservatory bit. Mm. So I went and bought them an electric blanket that went under the fluffy blanket, and I bought them all a little house. No. That was the first thing I, I can remember. <laughs> Everyone else just thought I was absolutely balmy. <laughs> I said, but I don't want them to get cold. Sure. Well, <laughs> what's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? Give me their time. They gave me their time, which is so precious. That's the kindest thing. Mm. And what did that mean for you? Everything. Everything. Because I had all these things I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to go about it. I didn't know how to do it. And um, for somebody to give me their time and show me how to achieve what I wanted to achieve... At no cost, you know, they didn't, they didn't want anything from me. Mm. They never asked me for anything, but they gave me their time. That's the most precious thing. Amazing. And time and ears. Ears. Yes. I, I think it changed my life completely because I'd been brought up the family thought I was a bit strange. My mum used to say, I don't know where she gets it from, like it was a disease, you know, and I was always wanting to do unusual things. But then when I met your mum mm. and your grandmother and they introduced me to the art world and music and um, classical music, I liked classical music, but I didn't know what it was mm. i wouldn't have known what to ask for nobody i knew in my family or friend circle ever listened to classical music none of my friends and family were artists or into art and then all of a sudden i i came across this amazing world that changed my life completely because i was surrounded with people who liked doing what i liked doing mm. And I wasn't odd, and I felt like I fitted in. 
even though I hadn't been to college and I hadn't experienced the life that they'd had, even though I'd had the children and everything, I just felt like this is where I belong. Mm. It was amazing. And it gave me the strength to be able to cope with problems. You know, it sort of filled my teapot up. Sure. Because if your teapot's empty, you can't pour anything out, can mm. you? You can't give. But yeah, it filled my teapot. My teapot was overflowing. Mm. <laughs> it was wonderful. And to give from the overflow. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 What's the happiest memories of your parents? I don't have any. I don't I'm really trying to think. No, I'm sorry, I don't I don't my my dad died when I was eight, and he was dying all my life. He had uh, two brain tumours, and my memories of my dad are of him lay. I can remember him having an operation and having a, a cap on his head where they shaved his head, and I, and my memories of him are him in bed, ill, and he couldn't he couldn't talk. So I haven't got any ni nice memories of my father, my dad. Um, my mum, she had a really tough time um, and sort of made one bad decision after another, bless her. And, and my mum died when she was only 59. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have any. Uh, I've never thought of it before, mm. but I... Yeah. My my mum, I never thought that my mum loved me, and I told her. I was grown up, obviously, I was about, I was married with children, and my mum had never said to me, I love you, I think you're great, which is what I tell my children, and I have done all their life. I still tell them now, I love you so much, I think you're so great which they are in my eyes, and I'm so proud of them. But to my, I was a problem to my mum. I, I was the naughty one. I was always, she never knew what I was going to do next, and I was a pain. <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, I never felt that she loved me. I, what happened when you told her? Um... <sighs> She cried, and she said, I do love you. And I said, but you've never told me. You know, I felt that my mum loved my sisters, and she showed them love much more than me, and she saw them all the time. She saw them, like, regularly, every day or every a couple of days, and I would only... I wouldn't see her that often. And um, she had, I just wasn't like them. And I, my mum said that I reminded her of my father. Um, and my mum said, where do you get your knowledge and your, your common sense from, she said. And I said, but it is, it is just common sense. It was like my mum, <laughs> my mum didn't think, she didn't question Whereas I question all the time. So, yeah. So what, what do you know of your father? I know that my father was very clever. Um, he was, my mum said he was head boy at school and that um, they wanted him to teach. But he wouldn't teach because he had epilepsy. Um, I think that's all I know of him, really. My mum said he was very strict, but very fair. Um, I mean, my mum had a horrendous upbringing. And, uh, and I think it goes through stages like... 
it's all relative. Like you, you think my mum had a really tough time. So compared to the way we had it, was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Even though it wasn't that great, you know. So mm. I think that that's what she thought. You know, you haven't got anything to complain about. You know, you should have been brought up the way I was. That sort of thing. Mm. So. How, how do you think if your father's situation had been different, how do you think that would have affected you, i.e. he, he my hadn't father. been sick? Yeah. Oh, I think he, he, he told my mum that he... This is a joke, by the way. It's not to be taken seriously. But my mum said... I drove her up the wall and she said, she's absolutely, I'm pulling my hair out. And my dad said, geniuses are very hard to live with, dear. My dad thought I was so clever. He really did. And I think had my dad have lived, he would definitely have sent me to art college. And it's not so much the fact that you learn how to paint and all that. I think it's the environment. I, you, I would have been mixing with people that I would have felt comfortable with and I would have made friends and that probably would have gone on through my um, work experience. You know, I probably could have gone into fashion and designing and all sorts of things because you're in the right place. Mm. My dad would have put me in the right place, I believe. Yes. So there was all of the desire to do it. Yes. Yeah, right from right from day one, all I ever wanted to do was paint and design clothes. I wanted to be a designer, but I couldn't spell it. I had dyslexia. Mm. But they called it reading blindness. They said to my mum... Your daughter's got reading blindness. Um, and they said she she writes Chinese and she reads Chinese. But I could read perfectly. But when it comes to spelling, I couldn't do it. Mm. So I just decided I'm not going to do that. Mm. There wasn't the help and the understanding then. Um, I still have problems. I mean, obviously, today you can just speak it and, it and it says it. But, you know, I could still write something today and I could see it tomorrow and I know it's wrong. Mm. It's very strange. Like, I remember I, I wrote on the tables in the print room, please leave your table clean and tidy. When I went in the next day, I could see I'd spelt it wrong. Mm. It's very strange. Can you describe your own taste in interiors and design? My own taste. A complete mixture. You could mix it all up. Moroccan, Chinese, Indian, full of colour, very rich. Um, it's like you could almost see all the world in one room. That's me. Where does that come from? I don't know. I think it comes from when I, when I was young um, and I lived in Finchley. Our street was so multicultural and I loved it. And I, if an Indian family moved in, I couldn't get in there quick enough. I wanted to see their clothes and mm. I wanted to know, you know, how they cooked their food and I wanted to taste it. And, and I was... I remember one day they were having a celebration and they laid all these saris in the garden and I couldn't, I'm watching every move and they laid all these japatis out in the garden on the saris. Now, my family were like, oh my God, what on earth are they doing? I couldn't get around there quick enough. I wanted to know what they were for. I wanted to know what they were doing. Mm. And they let me in. And I was the same, I used to go in all the houses and I loved all. I wanted little bits of every every house in in my little room. Mm. I loved it. My mum would say, will you stop keep going in all these other people's houses? No. No, I loved it. 
And I was always bringing things home. If, if any of you think was going, I'd say, I'll have it. I brought all this beautiful African use, um, material. I had a big bag of this African material and I practically fell in the front door and it all spilled out. And my mum said, what on earth are you going to do with that? I said, I'm going to make clothes. I was about nine. My sister remembers me making her clothes when she was, well, she was three years younger than me. So she was about seven, six or seven. Mm. And I would make her clothes. And I, I, never, I never ever thought there was any reason why I couldn't. I'd watch my mum sew, the little hand sewing machine, mm. and um, my sister would lay on the material and I'd draw around it and I'd make her clothes. <laughs> how, how did you learn that? Just from watching my mum. Right. And um, at the time, we're going back, I think it was 60s, and I remember making my sister a dress with a kipper tie, which was the fashion. And the fashion was also to have a zip with a ring on it. Mm. I put a zip in as well. And she remembers. It's bizarre. Mm. But I never... Th nobody else was doing that at that time. Strange, isn't it? So you, your mum gave you her time? No, I, I did it all myself. My mum had to work because my dad had died so young. I think he was 36. I think my mum was 32. And she's got three children. Anyway, she had to go to work. So while she was at work, especially in the holidays... We could do whatever we wanted. So my sister, I mean, I was nine, she was seven, six. Um, we would just go off to the park all day. We'd go to London on the buses, never paid. Mm. You know, go on the tube. Um, we would go here, there and everywhere, as long as we were back in time for, like, tea time. We could do whatever we wanted. I had a string around my neck with the key on to let myself in. Um, as I got older, I used to take the children home and um, give them some of my mum's sherry and Advocar and then top it up with water, as you do. <laughs> so, so, so you picked up on sewing by, by just watching your mum. So watching. when did your mum sew? She always sewed. Right. She used to make our clothes. But yeah, just watching my mum sew. Okay, she used to make all your clothes. She used as well. to make her okay. clothes. Yeah, so okay. she sewed. Right. Okay. And then, so you had this this woman making your your, your clothes, and then you had all of this culture around you. Yeah. And I loved it. Yeah. I really loved it. You know, they they were the happiest times in my childhood. Um, when we lived in Finchley and my mum was at work and, and I had such freedom. Mm. I had nobody to say, you can't go here or you can't go there or you can't have anybody in, you know. I had complete freedom. I was very happy. Even though my dad had died, mm. It was after my dad died that we got the freedom. Right. You know, because yeah. up until then, my mum was at home and we had to go and stay with different people because it was getting a bit too much for my mum. But, yeah, we had the freedom. How would you describe that shift? What, from when my dad died to the freedom? Mm. It was wonderful. I mean, we'd had to be quiet, you know, be good, um, because my mum had so much on her plate trying to look after my dad that we just had to be... And, and the flat was very small. It was tiny. We didn't notice it was tiny till I went back. You know, after I'd moved out and we'd moved to a bigger house in Muswell Hill, um, and then I went back to the flat... Mm. It looked so small, mm. but 
but you you know it was and it was you could get one thing out at a time you couldn't paint you couldn't make a mess um yeah it was it was very much like that so all of a sudden my dad died and my mum had to go to work and we had all day to do what we wanted to do it was great It's awful, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Who or what might have stopped you from realising your full potential? Realising my full potential? Um, Getting married so soon, I wasn't ready, didn't want to get married so soon. I wanted to leave home... But I definitely knew that I wasn't ready to get married. Hmm. But at the time, I couldn't see any option. And having the children, I suppose, and having a child that was very poorly. But then on the other hand, I can't really say that because that almost pushed me to my full potential. It's very hard. I'm... I'm not sure. I, I'm really not sure. I wish if I wish I could have gone to art college and fashion and everything and had the children later. I think if I'd have done it the other way round, I could have I could have had a much easier, happier life. Mm. I think I would have done well. I'm sure that I would have done well. Because I loved it so much. But I didn't think that it was possible. Hmm. So, yeah, probably getting married so early wasn't a good idea. And had you not, what do you... What do you think might have happened? I think I would have had a whole new life filled with music and art and people that that loved doing the same thing that I loved doing. It would have been a, I think it would have been a whole new world. I was, I it was very cross with my mum right up and, well, I still am, for not helping me in that way. But then when I look back, I, and I try and see things from her point of view, she was in such a world of, misery herself that she couldn't you know me wanting to go to art school was like not even on the agenda Mm. you know and you can't see it when you're a child it's not until you get older and you look back and you think that's i can see why she felt like that i I was cross that my mum went out a lot after my dad died because i felt like she should be here with me but then my poor mum had spent years looking after my dad and she hadn't been able to go anywhere or do anything. So I would imagine that when my dad did die, she probably breathed a mm. sigh of relief and she could suddenly go out and do things. But when I was a child, I was just cross with her. I thought, why don't you want to be with me? But obviously when we've gone to bed half past seven she's going to be there on her own all evening Hmm. but I didn't you don't see it like that I was very cross with her how long did that last a long time Hmm. because I thought why would you do that you can't go out and leave your children um you know I thought she would want to sit with me and help me with my reading that I was struggling with and you know I, I didn't understand so at what moment did you realise that? What was the trigger for you to go, oh? 
I think probably with 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 James, my son, who was really poorly. I mean, when you have a child that's got disabilities, the whole family becomes disabled mm. in a way. When you're told that you mustn't let this child catch a cold, um, if this child got pneumonia, it could die. You know, you you're so focused on trying to keep this child safe and alive, and and some of the other children. Well, they all suffer because you can't go out for the day unless it's really nice and warm and sunny. And in this country, that doesn't happen very often. You know, not yeah. like and if we'd have lived abroad, it would have been a lot easier. And you can't have people come to the house if they're not well. Hmm. And everything was focused on looking after this child that was really sick. And... That's when I think I realised how my mum might have felt. You feel trapped. And then when my son died and you didn't have that worry all the time, although you have that loss, which is huge, but you, you suddenly you, you're not worrying about about it all the time. And did you, with that in mind, how did you think, what sort of mother were you? Are you? Um, I think... I think I was probably quite selfish because everything evolved around what I wanted to make and what I wanted to do. Um, I did try very hard and fight for them to be able to have a, a good education because I think the best gift you can give to a child is an education. Mm. Um, and I didn't want them to struggle like I did. Um, I always gave them lots of love and made sure that they knew that they were loved. Um, but in order to be able to cope with the problems in my marriage and looking after a sick child, I think I just absorbed myself into painting and because that's what I needed to do. Mm. I didn't go and spend lots of time with them. I did what I needed to do to, to, to cope. And I think that, I mean, they tell me that they know that they knew that they were loved, they know they were loved, but life was very hard for them. And I can't honestly th think what I could have done any different to make things different. I can't, I only, I could only do what I could do. Because I, at the time I could only see one way. I mean, Having a large family and, and, and everything and one that's not well, it takes up so much, all of you. There's, n there's not enough left to give. But, I mean, we all, I tried, I can honestly say I tried my very best. Mm. Um, and, and you can't ask for more than that, really. Do you think your mum tried her best? Yes, I think she probably did. She just... She, my mum wasn't a thinker. My mum wouldn't think, oh, maybe I should do it this way or maybe I should do it that way. Um, it was just one way and that was it. And it, if you said why, it was because I said so. Mm. You know, um... And I, if somebody said why to me, I would explain why, you know. Mm. But I think, yes, she did. I think she did. I mean, 
how my mum coped is amazing, really. I mean, to be widowed, young, with three children and having to go to work. And she she wouldn't have great health, uh, but she always went to work. Um, yeah, I think she did try her best. I'm not cross with her anymore. But it took a long time because I didn't understand. Mm. What are the best features of middle age? Best features of middle aged um, confidence and self awareness and yeah, you don't worry so much. Well, that's me anyway. I, I, I yeah, you and you've got a sense of achievement, even if you've mucked up. Even if you've made mistakes, you look back and hopefully, well, I look back and I'm so proud. I've got got such lovely children. They are really lovely people. And and I feel really proud about that. And also, by the time you're middle-aged, the children are older. So you're more or less outside looking in a bit more you actually get a chance to step back and have a look and see how things are going and how things have gone and what you can change. Mm. Um, yes. Perspective. Yes. I'm not very good with words. <laughs> oh, I beg to differ. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. And grandchildren. Oh, I love grandchildren. How many do you have? Two. Are they your world? I love them so much because, well, one, because they're mine. Mm. <laughs> I say, how's my boys? Mm. Um, but they are such lovely people. I mean, Hayden's nine, Max is 12, and um, they're, they're, they care. And that's enough for me. They care. They're lovely. Um, I'm very proud of them. And so if if you'd if you had not married at seventeen and you hadn't had your five children, how does that feel? Because you wouldn't have your But I would have I always wanted children. Mm. I always wanted a large family. But I wish I'd done it the other way round. Well, I I think I do anyway. I I I think I would have been financially better off. I used to make all the children's clothes. I mean, money was tight a lot of the time. And children don't understand at all. They don't. They don't know why they can't have the expensive trainers and the expensive top like they tell you if all their friends have got. Mm. Um, and children, it's hard for them when you haven't got enough money, when money's tight. So I would have done it the other way around. Probably wouldn't have had so many, but then I wouldn't have had Elliot. Mm. And then I wouldn't have had James. So... Sometimes I think things are meant for a reason, but then I go down a little rabbit board and it all gets out of proportion and it I can't make sense of it. The universe playing its part. Yeah, sometimes mm. you think, well, if I hadn't have done that and I hadn't have done that, then I wouldn't have had this. So you sort of think, well, maybe it was meant to be. I don't know. The unlived life is a terrifying rabbit hole. Yes. But uh, alas an exploration that we don't go too far into no (laughs) because otherwise you can go oh my lord exactly yeah exactly well when you get to middle age you get the time to think about these things sure it's yeah you actually get as you get older you get you understand more things suddenly click and you suddenly think ah that's probably why when you're when you're bringing up the children and the younger, you don't have the time. Mm. 
I mean, they come home with so many pieces of paper of what they've got to do the next day. You've got this calendar on the wall that is like full and you've got to do all so much to do. You really don't have time to actually think, hmm, am I doing this right? You know, <laughs> you just, mm. you don't, it doesn't enter your head. You're just too busy trying to get through and do the best you can. And then when you get to middle age, you look back and you think, hmm, I could have done that a bit better, mm. you know. So um, one of the best features of middle age is time. Yes. How ironic. Because you talk to a lot of people, it's like a middle age. So, oh. What have I done or what have I, you know, this, that and the other. And I'm getting old. People always say, oh, I'm getting old. Not middle age. Well, middle age is, is maybe a big, what's middle age to someone might be middle age. Depends how long you live. This is it. If you only live for 38, 30 years, middle age is 20. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so I don't know. But yeah. By the time you get the hang of everything and you understand everything, it's time to go. It's really annoying. <laughs> but Not fair. As long as you let the children know that they're loved and give them time. Most precious thing. What do you imagine people might say when they gossip about you I think they would say that I'm funny entertaining a bit of a handful sometimes I might be a bit embarrassing I'm very outspoken I care and they think I'm lovely. There you are. Simple as that. Simple as that. <laughs> Knowing you for, well, I mean, we've had quite a, a, a long break, I would say, but that's exactly what I would say. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm biased. <laughs> Do you think other people regard you as a good listener? Yes, definitely. I try not to ask questions and just listen. And because I listen, they, they come to me. Yes, definitely. I don't judge. I just listen. And if I can help, I, I will. Yes. Do you know any other good listeners? Um, yes, I have a friend, friend Carol. She's a very good listener. Hazel, my daughter, she's a good listener. Um, my sisters. And 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 what is it about? Being a good listener that you like. What, me being a good listener or them being a good listener? Having somebody listen, what is it? What are the features of being a good listener that are? Because you can offload and know that you're not going to be judged and know that what you say to them is between you and them. Um, it's wonderful to know that that person is there that he's going to listen to you and care. I mean, it, it all comes down to whether you care or, or you don't. And mm. if you've got people in your life that care, then you are so lucky. And, and I have got people that care. And I care. You know, um, I end up looking after everybody because... <laughs> I can see, you know, if I'm in hospital, I'm looking after the patient in the next bed. And when the doctor comes around, I say, excuse me, but somebody told her to eat the bananas and then they told her that she shouldn't eat the bananas. And she's very confused. 
<laughs> that's me in hospital. I'm looking after people. And where I live, you know, I've got a neighbour who's really struggling mentally and and she just needs a hug. And most people would step back and they, they, all, they all avoid her like the plague. Mm. And, and she just needs a hug. <laughs> mm. You know, so, yes, being a good listener. Do you feel you live an ordinary or an extraordinary life? An ordinary life. Um, physically. <laughs> I try to make it as extraordinary as possible mm. in the things that I make and the things that I do and the way I decorate my home. Um, I try to make this little paradise for myself um, and when I'm in there, I do feel a little bit extraordinary. But I, I don't spend enough time with extraordinary people. Um, when we used to, when I used to work on the opera, um, for Palace Opera, and I used to see your grandmother regularly, and we used to be painting everything. I felt like. I belonged there, but I don't mix with people like that often enough. I don't know anybody. None of my family or friends paint or listen to classical music or or do the things that I want to do. So I, I'm not living the life that I would love to live, but I do the best I can. Thanks to YouTube, and I can listen to anything and all my music, um, which I do. I've I've discovered Andre. I can't say it properly because my Elliot's girlfriend is French, and she speaks properly. And when I said I've been listening to Andre Rue, she laughed because she said that's not how you pronounce it. And I've discovered him, and I love listening to classical music and him. I also like house music and trance. I like all music. What do you listen to when you paint? When I paint, classical music. Okay. Yes. It's always classical music. Or Ella Fitzgerald. The first time I came to an art class here... And um, I'd never, I'd never been to an art class. I didn't know what to do. And grandmother said, "Pull one of those donkeys over." I didn't know what a donkey was. It's a wooden structure that you sit on to draw. Mm. And I sat down, and I was very nervous. And then grandmother put Ella Fitzgerald on. I thought it was wonderful. Mm. So. So that stuck. Yes. And it reminds me of being in the clock tower, drawing. Mm. They were happiest times. My childhood from when my dad died mm. to when my mum remarried, that was very happy childhood times. And then the happiest times were from when I met your grandmother and your mum. And they introduced me to the art world and music and i'd be listening to it and i loved it i didn't mm. know who it was you know who's this it's mozart oh i like him mm. you know mm. <laughs> what about this one chopin right so i go home and i think right i've got to try and get some mozart and i've got to try and get some chopin because i really like it but i didn't know what to get mm. so i'd write it down i'd look at grandmothers i'd write it down i'd go in the shop and i'd get it and i'd come home and i'd put it on and they'd go what on earth are you listening to? I said, it's Mozart. It's wonderful. They didn't think it was wonderful. Mm. I did. Where did that, where's the house music come from in the trance? Um, I, I just love it. It makes me want to move and to, to see all them people. 
I mean, at one point there was like 18,000 people and it was just amazing. All my skin goes like chicken skin, mm-hmm. like goosebumps, and it affects me. It affects me in the same way that classical music does. Um, orchestral. Um, I just love it. My favourite instrument is a saxophone. I love a saxophone. I love jazz. I love all music. But I do like to listen to classical music when I'm painting. I don't know why, but I do. What advice would you give to someone 10 years younger than you about the next 10 years? Well, anybody that's 10 years younger than me. (sighs) Listen to everything. Question everything. Um, Don't listen to gossip. Don't assume things. Um... Do your very best. Give it your best. And try and be happy. That would be it. Debbie Ridsdale, thank you so much (laughs) for coming on the show. It's been so wonderful to speak to you. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this exploration into Debbie's unlived life, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the YouTube channel for a new episode every Wednesday. Did you gain something from this episode? Let me know in the comments section. I hope you enjoyed watching. Mm